Ruby. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Daniel Horan, um, and I am Professor of Philosophy, Religious Studies, and Theology here at St. Mary's, and I have the distinct privilege of serving as the Director of the Center for Spirituality. And I am so delighted to welcome you to this, our last Ex Libris Author Lecture Series event of this semester, more to come in the spring. But um, with all due respect to our previous presenters this semester, I guess this, the expression is the, save the best for last. So uh, actually, they're all pretty great. So. Let me say just a little bit about the Center for Spirituality. Founded in 1984 with the generous support from the Sisters of the Holy Cross, and shout out to our sisters who are joining us in person, and I know many who are joining us remotely. Um, the Center for Spirituality offers programs that promote the engagement between faith and reason and the connection between mind, body, and spirit. A hub for scholarly and public engagement, we draw on intellectual resources in the Catholic and Christian heritage, as well as how individuals practice faith in their daily lives to develop critical conversations around contemporary religious issues, especially as they relate to women's experiences in society, the academy, and the church. Before we proceed with our exciting event this afternoon, we wish to acknowledge that we are gathering on sacred land and to honor the native peoples who have been the traditional custodians of this place for generations. We particularly recognize the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and the Miami, who have cared for this land and its resources for many, many generations and who continue to do so today. It's with deep gratitude that we recognize our native siblings and their cultures within our community as well as acknowledging the land upon which we gather, pray, learn, and work. Just a note about the format of our program in this uh, Ex Libra series, as with the previous two events that we've had, those wonderful events this semester, the, the, the program is the same. First, uh, Mr. Robert Ellsberg is going to offer a brief presentation about his work. Next, he and I are going to engage in a conversation uh, about his book, the themes in his book. And finally, we will open the floor for questions and comments from both the in-person crowd here and those who are joining us virtually through uh, Zoom, through the webinar. So if you're joining us virtually through Zoom, we have our, our, our fearless student worker, Ms. Rebecca Holm, who is uh, operating Ground Central up there. Uh, feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A or into the chat, and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Just a reminder as well that the Campus Bookstore has copies of this book available for sale in the lobby, and Mr. Ellsberg will be around afterwards to meet you and gladly sign copies of his book. And now it's my privilege to introduce our guest today. Robert Ellsberg is the editor-in-chief and publisher of Orbis Books, where he has worked for the past 35 years. Robert interrupted his college studies in 1975 to work with Dorothy Day at the Catholic Worker in New York City where he eventually remained for five years, serving for two years as the managing editor of the Catholic Worker newspaper. After Dorothy Day's death in 1980, Robert edited her selected writings. And since then, he has edited four more volumes of Dorothy Day's writings, including her diaries and selected letters. On behalf of the Archdiocese of New York, he was appointed to the commission to prepare her cause for canonization, which is underway right now. Robert's interests in saints has extended to a series of books that have done much to enlarge the understanding of saints and holiness over the years. His books include All Saints, Daily Reflections on the Saints, Prophets and Witnesses in Our Time, The Saints' Guide to Happiness, and one of his more recent, A Living Gospel, Reading God's Story in Holy Lives. For over 10 years, he has contributed daily reflections on saints and holy figures for liturgical presses, give us this day. I know many of us here are subscribers to that. And I hope it's not a spoiler alert to say that um, next summer in July, the date escapes me right now, there is uh, it, one of the days of the saints' reflections will be on a certain Sister Madaliva Wolf. So if you're not a subscriber, subscribe soon. <laughs> Many of these reflections have been collected in Blessed Among Us. His latest book, uh, about which he's here to speak this evening, is called Dearest Sister Wendy, A Surprising Story of Faith and Friendship. And I should also like to add that I've had the privilege of knowing Robert and working with him now for many years, and I am personally honored to be able to call him a friend and a colleague. And so with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Robert Ellsberg here to St. Mary's College, and I invite you to join me in extending a warm welcome.
Well, thank you very much, Dan, and all of you who come this evening and those who are watching from the comfort of their homes, wherever that may be. Uh, this is this is exciting for me. Uh, this is actually the first time I've ever spoken about this book, and it's a little difficult to know even um, what that means. The um, as you'll see, uh, I'm just the co-author of this book. Uh, Sister Wendy Beckett uh, has the, uh, the is listed first as the author, co-author. It's really our book. But I, as I was saying to uh, Father Dan, I don't feel that I'm necessarily the best interpreter of this book or of its contents. Uh, I've read it, not just the editing of it, I've read it many, many times. I read it again in the last two days, cover to cover. And every time I do, I, I see something new in it. I discover something new. Uh, so I don't feel that I'm necessarily the expert in representing what Sister Wendy was all about, what her message was. I think I'll, I'll be reflecting on that uh, for as long as I live, but I'm I'm very glad at this opportunity to to share the story of the book. It, to, first of all, how many people here have any knowledge of who Sister Wendy Beckett was? Or, I mean, some, not some of the younger's probably not because she, her her celebrity came in the 1990s when she was discovered uh, by the BBC and given her own television program uh, to travel around the world to museums and talk about uh, art, and it was picked up here by PBS. And like many people, that's how I first got to know her as this sort of art nun. She she wore this medieval looking habit of her own sort of design. Uh, the more important thing to know about Sister Wendy was that she was born in 1930 and entered uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, a teaching order in South Africa uh, when she was 16 uh, and spent then uh, decades as, as a nun teaching, which was not really her... <laughs> heart's desire, her real vocation. She always felt that she was called to be a contemplative and to live a life of, of complete dedication to prayer and, and meditation on the presence of God. And she finally got permission to leave her order and was uh, became a consecrated uh, uh, virgin and hermit uh, living on the grounds of a Carmelite monastery in England. That was 1970. Uh, you, you, probably some of you are you know, familiar with a figure like Julian of Norwich. Uh, who lived not too far away, but in a different century, in the 14th century, back in the age of anchoresses, who would uh, be sealed up in a cell, a cell uh, attached to a church wall and really, you know, be sort of dead to the world and live this you know, total life of seclusion and contemplation. That was really her idea of the perfect life, uh, except she had a call to even, she felt even more total seclusion. She said Julian of Norwich had a window out onto the street where people could come and talk to her and ask spiritual questions. I, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, Julian might've had a cat. I would not want to have a cat. I couldn't possibly share my solitude with anybody, you know, uh, so focused on God. Now, the comical aspect of all of that is that she becomes this international globetrotting celebrity, at least for some while. Uh, she was interviewed by Bill Moyers and Charlie Rose, and she was, you know, the cover of all kinds of magazines. There was something very charming about her. There was something uh, quaint. Uh, she, as I said in the book, she was not someone out of central casting, you wouldn't think. Uh, she was this small, uh, diminutive, you know, figure with this sort of little hunched over, this black habit, protruding teeth, a little bit of a speech impediment, thick glasses. Um, but once she spoke, you couldn't take your eyes off her. Uh, she would stand in front of a painting, some work of art, and the camera would go on and she, without any script, without any rehearsals, just in one take, Sister Wendy, she would uh, speak about what she saw in this painting. And it, she would take you on this amazing journey, you know, into the heart of the artist and what he or she was saying in this painting or how she interpreted it. And it always was not just about what you saw in the painting there, but something deeper about, about the human condition. Uh, she really felt that this was, she said, the only apostolic work she had ever done, uh, <laughs> used to anybody else in the world, uh, because she felt that in talking about art, she was uh, teaching people how to see with the kind of eyes of the heart. And they might take that kind of contemplative way of seeing to all the other aspects of their lives. Uh, she said it was a way of talking about God to people who were not comfortable with that kind of language, uh, that talking about beauty was an entry, was a path that led to the source of, of beauty, ultimate kind of reality. Well, 
when that kind of time of her life was over, I don't know whether it was failing ratings or just her own health or she'd had enough of it. She went back to uh, living full time in her little trailer on the grounds of this Carmelite monastery. And where I come into the picture is a long time ago because I saw her on TV. We began to exchange some notes. Uh, I'm a publisher. I sent her books, which she enjoyed. She, I wrote books, which she was kind enough to endorse. She wrote books that I published. Uh, and so we had a just exchanged business-like friendly correspondence. At one point in 2013, she said, I like, you know, I enjoy your letters, but uh, if I'm to, you know, devote myself to a life of silence, communication that doesn't have a real purpose is doesn't really fit into that, you know, I don't really have space for that. So I, I said, fine, fair enough. I wasn't trying to be buddies with Sister Wendy or anything. I respected her, her, her boundaries. I discovered as I got to know her later, you know, that this call to solitude was not just a, a matter of vocation in the sort of religious sense, but it was a deep reflection of her temperament and her personality. All her life, she'd felt that she was a misfit, that she didn't fit in with other people, uh, that she just wanted to be alone with God. Uh, I want to be alone. <laughs> I don't, you don't get that reference. Anyway, um, she, uh, she, when she joined the, the this order at the age of 16, she had no comprehension of what the implications were of joining a teaching order. She thought, I'll be a nun. I'll get to pray all the time. Uh, that's not the way it was. And she was very miserable, really, but she felt it was the will of God that she, this was what she was called to do until she had a com kind of complete physical breakdown. And they finally said, okay, you can go do, do what, what you want. And she became this hermit. So she returned to the life of being a hermit. And this, she was, you know, would never have maybe been heard from in the world again. Three years after that little, you know, gentle brush off that I had, uh, I got a note from, uh, she was now t uh, living inside the enclosure of the monastery because she was too old and frail to live by herself. And a sister would come in once a day and with a laptop computer and take dictation and so help her with correspondence. Uh, and the sister wrote to me and said, we sent you a, an Easter card and it was returned because the address had changed. So I sent her my card and I said, by the way, we're, we're publishing a book of uh, writings of Vincent van Gogh. And she wrote back with great interest in that. I'm very interested in that. I want to hear more about it. We began exchanging some notes. Now, as, as, as you heard, I have a background in writing about Dorothy Day and about saints. So we had these topics of great mutual interest. Uh, but I assumed after one, one or two of these exchanges of letters, that would be the end of it. Uh, but they just kept happening. They kept coming. And before you knew it, this was a, a very major part of both of our lives. I mean, not in terms of the time, but uh, existentially. Um, uh, every morning I would wake up with this letter as if I were getting a letter from Julian of Norwich in her anchorage or something like that. And, uh, and it would go back and forth. And this became almost a daily thing uh, for the next two and a half years until she died in December of 2018. Um, this book, what is it? It's, it's very, yeah, I think it's entertaining, interesting about this relationship between two very dissimilar people. One, this, you know, elderly and dying. Uh, she had uh, a terminal lung condition. Uh, didn't, I, I didn't in the beginning expect that she would live very long at all, but lasted you know, a couple of years, uh, constantly having heart attacks, whatever. Uh, but this hermit, you know, who, who had very strict kind of boundaries and had never let anybody really deeply in, in, intimately into her life uh, and didn't, didn't, didn't want to have special friends, didn't want to have special correspondence. Uh, that was not what, what she was all about. In fact, the irony is that when I finally got that Easter card that had gone astray in the mail, it was an Easter card. It was, it was the words, it was a painting of Jesus and Mary Magdalene where he says, no, let me tangere. Don't, don't touch me. <laughs> I thought that was the perfect message for Sister Wendy. You know, I thought there's some little message she was sending there. Don't touch me. Don't cling to me. Whatever. Don't hold on to me. You know, Jesus is saying to, to Mary Magdalene. And that, that could have been Sister Wendy's motto. Uh, but something happened here, and I found some kind of key that opened up this interior castle that she lived in. And what you see is the development of this relationship uh, that I can only describe as, as just love, uh, a kind of maternal side uh, to her that she had never allowed herself to experience. And the idea that this elderly hermit is experiencing this and discovering this kind of capacity for relationship and intimacy 
at the very end of her life, you know, when she was already so you know, immersed in the love of God, but maybe not so much in, in other kinds of love. Um, at a certain point, you know, I, I was urging her, I wish you would write more about your interior life or your story. And she said, oh, that's, no one would be interested in that. That's rubbish. Uh, completely uninterested in that, in that kind of idea. She, she disdained, you know, the whole idea of self-examination. She said, I know that's important to some people, but for me, I don't see the point. I just live completely in the presence of God. That's all that matters. Um, but at a certain point, you know, <laughs> she actually said, you know, it occurs to me that that book you're talking about maybe could be cobbled together from some of these letters that we've been sharing because they'd gone to such a deep place. Uh, it's hard for me even to, you know, when I was reading through this book, it's hard to just read it because you just stop on every page as almost a little mini retreat. Uh, the depth of her uh, spirituality and of her thoughts on on prayer and the church and Jesus and the cross and suffering and holiness and heaven and uh, you name it is it is it is almost like a diamond. It's it's just so compressed. Um, and uh, from this lifetime of in intensive, you know, prayer and contemplation, but it's also charming. It's funny. It's hilarious. We share stories about our dreams, and and what started with her, you know, welcoming me to share some of my own life, became reciprocated as she began to think about her own childhood, her own story, her own peculiar vocational, you know, uh, kind of journey that led from you know, began when she was four and was on, sitting under the table in the dining room and had this overwhelming sense of the presence of God, like a total blast of, of God's love, and knew at that point that that's all she wanted to do in life was to, to live for God alone. Uh, and then she had this sort of detour of being a teacher and all that kind of thing. But she said even the experience of the novitiate uh, kind of was helpful, and she, she recognized that a certain selfishness she thought in herself, and she said there was this, the novitiate was very helpful for that. But it was also very... Uh, humiliating in a lot of ways because she felt that that nobody could really understand her she felt always like a misfit like an ugly duckling kind of in this pond uh, where she wasn't with her own kind she thought that when she became a nun all nuns would have the same experience she she didn't realize how exceptional her sensitivity to god was she, it's sort of like having perfect pitch or you know seeing auras or something like that that until you discover that not everybody can do that you realize how strange you are and when she would talk about her feelings or experience, even, you know, the novice mistress or the prioress or whatever, they all looked at her like she was a kook or something. They didn't understand her at all. And I think that contributed to some of this privacy uh, that she that she maintained. Um, somehow within our correspondence, she began to feel a trust and, a, and a, an ability to explore things that she hadn't before. Uh, and she reflected back to me, it was not all just one way, uh, encouraging me to really think about my own life. Here's somebody who didn't believe in thinking about her own life, but she encouraged me to think about my life and to see the ways that God was present in my story and not just in the moments of you know, breakthrough or revelation, but of, of my own conf times of confusion and sorrow and failure and heartbreak. Uh, and we began to kind of share this together. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly what else, how to, to introduce this book. It's hard to answer questions when, you, when you know, people who haven't, haven't read the book. Uh, but my, my hope is that, that, and my experience so far, is that people who read this don't just come away saying, wow, that was an, what a fascinating, beautiful story this was of the relationship of these two people. But uh, so many people have said to me, reading this book, I just triggered or opened up these doors of my own consciousness and memories of my own story. And to kind of, you know, we both had become sensitized in our correspondence to these um, twists and turns in our stories and that in the ways that God was present in that, in that, uh, in that story. Uh, we shared all kinds of things, dreams. There's a lot about <laughs> dreams, my dreams, uh, her dreams uh, about the people I met. She felt that She'd been living in this enclosed little cell, and she said, I, I feel like I've always had this you know, great love for God, but I tended to kind of blot out other people, you know, blot out the rest of the world somehow. Uh, she was very charming, you know, uh, uh, people enjoyed meeting her when she met people when she was traveling, 
but she always kind of kept it all at a at a distance and uh she said that that you know through what i brought to her is my kind of as an editor all the people i worked with the people i'd known the kind of books i worked on and that sort of my engagement with uh with uh, social justice and peace and other social issues she said she felt that that i was bringing the whole kind of world into her 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 cell uh and that it was enlarging her you know it's um it's you know it's funny when you you know you think that like you actually have a gift that you can give to 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 somebody who is awesome like like that i mean i felt that way with uh you know dorothy day when i my knew when i was when i was very young and i was 19 when i first met her uh worked with her for five days and year many years later after she died uh you know so one of her friends said you know you can't imagine what it meant to dorothy when you became a catholic and i said well, gosh what 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 I meant to Dorothy Day, <laughs> it's just like incredible, you know. Uh the 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 gift that this relationship was uh for me is a, is one that that is, you know, that I will spend the rest of my life trying to think, you know, what hit me here and how this miracle happened and why me and and how did I was I sort of gifted or chosen to privileged to be the recipient of this of this heart of this incredible mystic and spiritual genius and and i dare say a holy woman uh who had so much to share people know of her as as i say the art nun but this is a side of her that that she did not share uh she felt that it was uh that that it was just too intimate you know for for her to reveal to people and she thought it was of nobody's interest no one would be interested in it um but it's uh it's 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 not just a back and forth of letters. There's a narrative arc to this. There's a story as you see us both growing closer to one another, but also growing, you know, in awareness and capacity to, 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 to love, to understand things in a new way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, well, I don't, maybe that, maybe that's a good place to begin that introduction because we, more, we can go more deeply into some things and conversations. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you so much for um, for setting this up for us and giving us a little bit of background, because I think even those who may uh, know something of Sister Wendy, uh, they know from PBS or know from YouTube or something like that. And um, as you say, the the book is 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 truly incredible. I don't say that just because you're here, um, although it probably doesn't hurt. To, it'd be it'd be terrible hospitality if I said this book stinks. But the the truth is, you know, I think when when folks think about a published um, correspondence, you know, a, a collection of letters, it can seem sort of dry and historical and, and boring, but there is a real flow to this, as you say, a narrative arc uh, where we get to see you in, in greater detail, your, your life, your experience, but also get to see Sister Wendy um, and her sharing her questions. Um, where I'd like to begin is with something you mentioned in passing in your introduction, and um, you begin the book by talking about this or including Sister Wendy's uh, quotation from her letter, and then in your epilogue, you you're afterward, you come back to it, which is this uh, line. She says, I quote, I like communicating with you too, but if I'm to live a life of silence, communication without a real purpose has to be sacrificed. Um, and and that's like one of the the best backward compliments ever. I really like you know corresponding with you, but this isn't really that important. So, what do you think accounts for her initial statement? Um, and then the volume of letters. Um, we were talking earlier. The original, the the unedited um, copy is three hundred and fifty thousand words, and and this is not even a tip of that iceberg. And so, obviously, something came around um, in her thinking about communication with a real purpose. How do you understand that? How do you think she meant that? Well, I think in, in the beginning, she felt that we were talking about things that mattered, uh, <laughs> topics that were of extreme interest to her. Uh, the question of, of holiness, uh, meaning of saints, 
Um, she was very interested in in my involvement with the story of and legacy of Dorothy Day, my writings about saints. Um, I'd written a book called The Saint's Guide to Happiness that she in, had endorsed. Um, so she was she was very interested in the question of that we both shared that that you know the interest in saints is not just interest in these spiritual prodigies that we reverence or we revere, uh, but that they teach us something about how to live and how to deal with, how to kind of metabolize uh, ordinary life, uh, suffering, work, uh, in relationships, family, death, uh, and to uh, make of that the kind of the arena or the kind of fuel that, that, that drives us toward the, the, our, our goal or our purpose in life. So she felt that in a way she'd found a kind of comrade who, who shared, you know, what she was really interested in. I'm sure there are people that she would exchange, you know, thoughts about art about. I didn't really have a whole lot to say about, about that. But it turned out that this was this topic that, you know, this is what really what she'd given her life to and was of, of, of great interest to her. So there was a lot there uh, of common interest. I, I, she was very fascinated by the series that I edited at Orbis called Modern Spiritual Masters. And when she saw the list of people who were in this uh, series, she she was kind of ravenous. And I began sending her all these books. And she was a voracious reader. She would read several books a day. She was extraordinary. And she would write back with these incredibly insightful, uh, you know, uh, biting um, you know, kind of assessments of, of each person and what their strength was. You know, this is somebody who has one one song to sing, but it's a beautiful song. And, you know, this person has many songs, but maybe not as profound or whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, she could really see, you know, that, and she was a kind of connoisseur of, of, of holiness. Um, so it began that way, you know, but uh, eventually it began to enlarge, you know, into not just how we see God in the lives of the saints, but how we see God in in ordinary life, in our own life stories, uh, in our, our own relationships and where we've come from. And that began opening a door into something, things that she said, I've, I find I'm, I'm thinking about this for the first time. She's saying about her childhood. I haven't thought about this or the remorse she felt about the way she treated her sister when they were little and things like that. Um, and, you know, as I, I found that, that, at one point, she said, you know, I, I could write a book of you know, reflections, maybe if someone asked me good questions. So I said, well, I, I have lots of lots of questions here. Here's a here's let's start here. What's your ordinary? What's a day in the life of a hermit look like? And or what you know, were, did you ever were attracted to Carmelite spirituality or what? I had these kind of questions with that. Now, I, I, I didn't mean it was gonna be all like that. I thought we'd start there and we get into deeper things. And she said, Oh, dear, dear, those questions don't interest me at all. You know, um, I think there's no point in that, uh, Robert, uh, this, but the, but the fact later on, she said, I feel a little bad that I was so high hat about this. So here's some answers to your question. She began giving these amazing answers about, about what her life was like, how she had set up this, her kind of rule or discipline for her life as a hermit and her relationship with the Carmelites and went all, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and I'd said, well, I, I really do wish you would write more about your, your, your kind of story or inner life. No, 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 no. But then, as I say, eventually she said, well, you know, maybe you could cobble something together out of this book. Now, that, I, I think at that point, maybe both we thought, you know, we'll take out the highlights that have to do with the, the spiritual topics or something. Maybe there's a little book in there. I don't think she anticipated at that point that the correspondence, the relationship itself was the book, uh, that we were writing a book together, unawares. You know, we weren't thinking about that as at that point, it, it had been just became a relationship. So... Uh, I think that that um, you know that somehow this was not a violation in her mind of. Sometimes I'd say I, I'm I'm sorry I'm imposing with you on on all these you know writing about my friends or about my children or some. She said, no 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 this is this is a deeply spiritual letter you've you've sent me. She even said at one point you know whenever you talk about your friends I know you're going to be talking about God uh, because you know I, I I did have this way I. I talk about someone and I would size them up and they're the whole what's the idea or the problem or the theme of of their story and how they have uh, dealt with these challenges or whatever and it was, in a way it was the way I write about saints uh it was really a subject of great interest to her it was she said I I I 
I feel that I don't know myself very well, but I feel I'm very good at understanding other people, or at least understanding their holiness, which they may not know themselves, you know, and I think that was a lot of what I felt that that we were sharing was about the ordinary sanctity of everyday life, and uh, as reflected in 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 people and nature and relationships and in, in in sorrow and suffering, uh, and so ultimately I, I did feel I, at the end of the book and uh, my epilogue I I referred to a great conversation between Saint Augustine and his mother Monica uh, that he describes in in the before Monica died in the in the uh, in the Confessions where he describes they're actually talking about the happiness of the saints in heaven. And they go in this amazing kind of dialogue and conversation. He said, we just kept going higher and higher and higher until I felt like we could almost reach out and touch, you know, ultimate truth. And then, of course, we, you know, had to come down and we found our own voices and we come back down to earth, whatever. I, I felt there was something like that in this, that it started off in this narrow way of talking about saints and holiness and then became, you know, everything is holy. Everything is, everything has to do with sanctity and uh god's presence in our lives i'm i'm tempted um as as somebody who has written a, a book or two and sitting with a publisher one of my publishers full disclosure um one of the things that i i found that really makes this book distinctive among published correspondence letters is an editorial decision that that you made in the process that is absolutely significant in the best way, which is these little italicized sort of commentary, sometimes even in the middle of a letter um, that set up or summarize something or, or you know, provide some commentary along the way. Um, and it allows for not just like watching a tennis match, right? As you're reading this book, it's not like Robert writes this, Sister Wendy writes that. Robert writes this and then serves the ball back. But instead, there is a flow to it. How did you arrive at that, if I may ask? Like, what? It, it's unique. I'm glad you appreciated that. Uh, you know, I went through many, many drafts, mostly cutting this down, cutting it down, whatever. And that was actually the last thing that occurred to me. Uh, and I thought that it totally transformed the book because I felt that it had the effect of making the reader a participant uh, so you're not just reading these letters, you say, back and forth between me and Sister Wendy. But it's not as if I'm sort of breaking the, the fourth wall or something and talking to the audience. But sort of, you know, it it, it was uh, a way of stepping back. So I'm not just responding to Sister Wendy. I'm kind of speaking to the reader, you know, about um, how I'm reacting, for instance, to what something Sister Wendy said or what it meant to me or a concern, you know, you know, she said uh, at one time uh, there was going to be a break in our correspondence, I think, because Sister Leslie, our, our amanuensis, who took all the dictation, was going to be away for a week or so. Maybe you should spend this time, Robert, to think whether you really have the time for this correspondence. And I'm thinking, is she telling me that she doesn't have the time for this correspondence? You know, and there's a gentle way of saying, uh, you know, you back off or something like that. Or is she really worried about me? You know, so. Uh, so I, I can say to the reader, you know, I, I raised that question that I had, you know, responding to that, or when I was sharing some kind of personal uh, detail about my life and a little bit worried about what her reaction would be and how reassured I was, you know. Uh, but in other times, it was just a matter of uh, I needed, you needed information from my letter to set up her response, but my letter itself was not important. And I could, I could, some, I wrote to Sister Wendy about such and such, and then you understand what her response uh, uh, means. Uh, so it was a way of keeping things moving, you know, and not getting bogged down in just the factuality of what he said, she said. You know. There are a number of uh, really um, overt threads throughout the correspondence. You know, one of them you've touched on, which is near and dear to your own work and, and life, which is saints and holiness. You know, the, the contributions you've made in your in your books on the saints and your work on the saints um, really comes through and it's clear how much Sister Wendy appreciates that. Um, another theme that you've touched on as well is, is the personal journeys, both a glimpse into Sister Wendy's prayer life, her personal life, her history, her sense of the of the world and experience and, and yours. I've known you for a while and I was learning lots of new things all of a sudden, which was uh, which is really endearing. Um, and another theme that that is throughout and maybe occasioned not only from your own personal experiences with with some health issues that you've 
disclose to Sister Wendy in real time, but also her own terminal illness and preparing for death, is that the themes of sickness, mortality, and suffering appear a lot. And so one question I had that I wanted to ask you is, you know, are there things you learned about suffering or death from this exchange? Did you, did you find Sister Wendy to be a kind of teacher in that aspect of your own life and reflection? Well, I, I had, uh, you know, studied a lot of these kind of questions from my own reading of the saints and spirituality. I wrote a book about it, you know, the saints guide to happiness, uh, where that I, I felt didn't come out of my own wisdom or anything, but out of my reflection on, on, on the saints, what they have to teach us about suffering, about death. Um, but in a way, sister Wendy would be saying, you know, go back and read your own book. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, these things, you know, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that our happiness does not depend on on outward circumstances. Uh, we know that that both of us have experienced how how new life, resurrection, can ap appear out of what seemed dead and uh, a dead end. Uh, uh, you know, things like that. That and and it was of course remarkable to see someone. You know, who she's, you know, for instance, I, I I wrote to her about a friend who was having difficulty. He said I, he's having heart problems. He's suffering a lot and says, I, I don't find that I can pray. And she said, we can always pray. Prayer, you know, people have this idea that you have to be on some high spiritual level in order to pray. God accepts our, 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 accepts us in whatever state we are. And that is our, that's the prayer we, we bring, you know, and if our, if we're distracted, if we're angry, if we're depressed, if we're suffering, if we can't come up with words, God fills that space. And 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 it was things like that 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 it was it was just this kind of master class in 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 you know classic Christian spirituality. Uh, you know, I, the, the desert fathers, people would say, uh, you know, would go to a monk or something and say, you know, give us a word or something like that. And and maybe he would say some wise thing, uh, but in every letter, uh, Sister Wendy was was bringing this to me, you know, and not just the point of not just her own wisdom, but she was kind of taking all the daily drudge of my own life, which I offered up to her, uh, and kind of just placing it on the altar of her heart, you know, blessing it and returning it back to me. Uh, in which, you know, I, I could look around and say, she was constantly saying, do you have any idea how, how blessed you are? And she didn't mean just because oh, happy things were happening in my, in my life, but all of the ways that, 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 uh, that I could see great signs of grace in my, in my life. Uh, and it was like this kind of spiritual magic mirror, you know, back to me. So, uh, and of course it was, it was very moving to to witness her her you know increasing fragility uh the three parts of the book the correspond to the three years of her correspondence the first i called uh learning to see the art of seeing uh because you know this idea of seeing contemplative kind of vision the eyes of the heart are so much a theme of what she brought to her uh her contemplation or reflection on art but also just her attitude toward life in general the second uh, chapter, the art of loving, and you know, it was reflected. I think more the, the kind of relationship we were experiencing, and the way that that I saw this enlargement in her own attitudes, uh, and then the third, the the art of letting go, uh, that has you know, it's both my letting go of her, but her kind of. Uh, the, I, I shared with her a story of of a friend of mine who was dying of cancer who said he'd had this deep uh, re kind of insight of like the image of an hourglass, like his time is running. We usually think of the, of the, the, the sand, you know, running down in the hourglass, but it's, it's actually filling up in the bottom. It's, it's not disappearing, you know, it's, be, it's, it's a transfer, you know, of, of everything that has been invested in a life is, is, is pouring out, but it's pouring somewhere. And that, that was, she, she liked that very much, but I think that was, she, she felt, you know, this, that this temporal life was ending, but it, this was the opening to, to something that she'd look forward to all her life. And she said, you know, uh, when you, the last letter, you know, when you hear that I've gone, you know, 
you know, I hope you'll you'll know it's a time of the greatest joy for me. And uh, and I hope you'll rejoice uh, for uh, God's goodness in my life, you know. And it was, you know, uh, of course, yes, I was sad uh, when she died, but there was this wholeness and completeness. And I thought like, well, there was, we could have kept on exchanging letters forever. I would have enjoyed that. But uh, everything had been said, you know, there's nothing more that we had to add. Um, Thank you. Um, to change gears just a little bit, I would be remiss um, if I didn't mention Thomas Merton. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was, uh, this is another theme that that is consistent in, in the correspondence, the figure of Thomas Merton and uh, Sister Wendy's initial skepticism, resistance, um, lack of appreciation. I don't know what you want to call it. It's, yeah. it's more, it's more ambivalence. It's more mixed feelings. She she loved Thomas Merton. She was obsessed with Thomas Merton. I didn't bring him up all the time. She's always talking about Thomas Merton. He's always there. He's always should bring up Thomas Merton. And sometimes, you know, uh, and but always, you know, she, he he delights me. He fascinates me. He drives me crazy. He you know he disappoints me. He bothers me. And and it it was clear that, that there was something more to this when you're when you have this kind of surfeit of. Know, uh, emotion about about some you know guy who's been dead for decades what, what do you care you know uh she kept coming back to him and now here's this guy who was a monk famous spiritual writer uh became a hermit not not a hermit exactly like her uh and she read everything that he wrote even the really obscure kinds of things you know she would read about him uh and she would always have this undertone of of disapproval that she felt he was not a real contemplative he was not a real monk he was too inconsistent he uh he's he she didn't like his uncharitable attitude toward his fellow monks and the abbot and all all the stuff that he wrote down in his journal you know it's like you know that he he shared it everything all of his missteps his his falling in love with the nurse and all this kind of stuff and uh i thought that maybe that you know from her point of view that would be the shocking thing that he fell in love and everything no that that, that was just a that she says oh, that was a midlife crisis or something like she but she was other things that really bothered her. And I would, you know, I've always, Thomas Merton, very important to me. I don't aspire to be a, a, a hermit or anything like that. But I, I always saw in Merton somebody, this kind of spiritual explorer who didn't quite fit in the old mold of this ascetical kind of model of contemplative life, but was pointing towards something different. I, mean, I think that's what Pope Francis recognized when he named him as one of the four great Americans. He said he was kind of a man always on the, on the you know, going toward the horizons and the borders and dialogue. Uh, that's the thing that Sister Winnie didn't seem to like about him. Anyway, uh, so we'd go back and forth. We even had some arguments about it, you know, because I, I felt that she was really being unfair to him. Uh, that there was more to him than this way she was kind of assessing him. And so there's actually, you know, if you're interested in this, you don't have to read the whole book. Uh, an America magazine ran a, a thread of this correspondence about Thomas Merton. Uh, this Sort of in the, toward the end of the second year of our correspondence, she has this total turnaround where she says, you know, I feel I've totally misjudged uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, he's and he's he's much too large for me to appreciate, and I have to, in my humility, I have to say that that reflects on me and my own narrowness and my smallness uh, next to someone like that. Uh, she said, "His, you know, there are th many things that are I think are wrong about him, but his wrongness is so connected to his rightness. Uh, he was a one-off kind of figure. Yes, he he seemed to think that he had this big uh, you know role in the world and." social justice and peace and everything well well he did you know, he's right to think that and i think she thought that the abbot you know understood that he was a, a kind of a unusual case and treated him with with some you know, wisdom and respect uh she said that that there's lots of muddle and confusion in his life but it was his it was the direction of his life his under all of it his deep desire for god uh was totally genuine and that means that all the rest of it doesn't matter anymore. Well, this was this. You'd say, well, Sister Wendy changed her mind, except that Sister Wendy never changed her mind about anything. 
she never, she said, you know, what I've written, I have written. She, everything was just one draft, one take, you know, and she uh, never changed a word or edited anything she'd written. And these were, so there's a deep kind of conviction and not just an opinion about is, you know, is Citizen Kane the greatest movie ever made or something like that. Something that she was obsessed by kept coming back to. And you say, what's that all about? To me, this change I felt, and if you just read the exchange in America about Merton, you'd say, well, where does that come from? If you read the book, you have to see it in the context of, of this arc, of this narrative, of this changing change that was occurring in both of us through this relationship. And I think that caused her to open up and to let go of a lot of her rigid sort of ideas. The thing is, I, I, I don't think I'm really over-dramatizing when I say that I compared it in the book to Thomas Merton's kind of moment of awake, famous awakening on the corner of fourth and walnut everybody you know knows the annals of merton how after being in the monastery for many years he goes downtown louisville and he says you know on the corner of fourth and walnut i i suddenly realized that i loved all these people they were you know he before had sort of thought of the monastery as this perfect place the center of the universe and this escape from all the the sin of the world and all the confusion and everything like that and the, the monastery was kind of keeping the world going through this engine of, of prayer that was going on self-sacrifice he says it was like awakening from a dream of separateness of this uh spurious kind of holiness and separation from the world and after that his whole direction of his his writing changes completely he begins he says it's like i'm, I'm now it's now a whole new understanding that's not not generated around this idea of asceticism, but is about humanism, you know, and he becomes more compassionate and open to social justice and race issues and this kind of thing. Uh, Dan knows a lot more about that than I do, but but uh, I you know who knows where Sister Wendy would have gone with this. But to me, it it felt the, in a very similar way that it was a, a awakening from from a dream of separateness in which her special holy place in in this in this hermitage. Uh, was very disconnected from from uh, the rest of the world and allowed her a certain amount of i think you know judgmentalism uh, and rigidity in these kind of categories so um, with an eye toward time and wanting to make sure there's there's opportunity for questions from the uh, in-person and virtual audience i'm just stating that for our introverts to start revving up your 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 ideas and questions i want to do a quick lightning round of naming some of my favorite scenes and and stories and maybe this will pique the interest uh, for people who want to read the book in its entirety or maybe some of the questions that you might want to ask there are a lot of when Robert was offering his introduction, there were you mentioned dreams a lot, but it wasn't just dreams like dreams and hopes, but literal dreams. <laughs> you talk about some very interesting dreams. You have very vivid dreams and, and Sister Wendy shares some as well. So that's something very interesting. Um, I was really struck by, you know, and, and I think, Robert, you you are very humble um, and not name dropping as much as you really could, given that you've worked with some of the most significant spiritual, religious, and theological figures of the 20th century, Gustavo Gutierrez, James Cone. I mean, we could go on and on and on. And you you share one line um, that has that really stayed with me from James Cone when you, near the end of his life, were asking him about the Black Lives Matter protest. And, and you asked, you know, have you joined the demonstrations in New York? Have you gone out and protested? Have you demonstrated? And his short response was, I demonstrate with my pen. <laughs> um, more there. I was struck by Sister Wendy's strong position against U.S. Catholics becoming one issue people. Her sense of what was happening politically and in the church in the 2016, 2017, 2018 era. I love the game that you and Monica play in museums, art museums. So if people are interested, you can ask about that. Um, I learned about the story of your solitary confinement in Colorado. I didn't know about that. Um, and then one last fun thing I'll say before one real question, and then we'll open it to the floor, is uh, in addition to the disagreement, perhaps, between you and Sister Wendy over Thomas Merton, I think a stronger disagreement the two of you had was over your admiration for Princess Diana and Sister Wendy having no patience for her or whatever. I believe if I paraphrase her response, it's a, using the language of my own mother growing up. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's That was kind of her response to you. Um, this will be a, just a short question, and then um, from the floor and from the from the virtual audience, you you've worked with so many um, authors over the years, um, including in the genre of memoir. You've worked with your father, Daniel Ellsberg, 
you've worked with Sister Helen Prejean on her re relatively recent uh, memoir. And Sister Wendy, over and over again, encourages you to write a memoir or probably many volumes. Will we get to see yours someday? Oh, that's a good, good question. You know, it's funny that from the very beginning, she said, uh, she said, it would, I'm glad you're working with your father on his memoir, but it would make me overjoyed, you know, if he, I would leap you know, with Olympic heights or something, if you were to write your own autobiography. And I, you know, I didn't know where is that coming from exactly. It's not just that I've known a lot of interesting people and interesting experiences, but she really felt that, that I, you know, what I shared with her, I had, uh, such a sense of of how god was present in that story um and she felt that's exactly what what people need to hear you know that's it's not just because i thought well i don't re write a book just to say well, i've had an interesting life or i've known interesting people or i had an interesting father or something like that but that there was a, a message there you know she said you know communicating the things that that really matter <laughs> and she felt that she had nothing to say about herself she thought uh, but she, at least looking at me, uh, felt that, that there was something. There. So I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. Okay. We'll be waiting for it. <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Fetter has a microphone on the move. So if you just raise your hand here in the uh, in-person audience and virtually use the Q&A button or the chat button, and Rebecca will make sure we pass that along. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to read uh, this book. I was struck um, by what you shared with us about how Sister Wendy understood herself as a misfit. Um, and I think one reason this took out to me is I was thinking about Dorothy Day, who I also think is the sort of misfit figure. And so I'm wondering, you know, in your experience with these women, in your study of the saints more broadly, is there something to this sort of misfit figure and great holiness or saintliness you know or is there a special place in the communion of saints for these these misfit women um in your experience do you have any thoughts on that really uh, interesting question you know i um i i quoted to sister wendy a couple of times you know my wonderful uh conclusion of, of george Eliot's book uh middle march where she talks about her heroine, uh, Dorothea, you know, Brooke, and, and says that, uh, you know, that there is, uh, who knows you know, how many St. Teresas there are out there who, because of their circumstances, when they lived, they, they, they always were just kind of a, 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 a you know, the misfit in this pond. Uh, there's a signet in a pond of ducks that, and that never found it. It's other or, ori footed, you know, foul friends or whatever like that. But the, this idea that, that, um, uh, so many people have a strong sense of vocation, and there doesn't seem to be any place for that. And now, in the case of women, I've written a whole book about women saints, and I and I I'm so impressed by their stories because in so many times they had to kind of invent a new way uh, because they were told, well, there's this way, there's this, there's like three different. You can get married, you can live in a convent, you can be a martyr or whatever. Uh, but uh, and they would say, well, I feel like I'm being called to something different. And there was always, you know, some usually male authorities who would say, well, that's not God's will for you. That's not what God wants women to do or something like that. And I, I think that uh, Dorothy Day was certainly, you know, like that in the sense that she felt, you know, this deep sense that she was being called to something. She she was giving up so much in her life to become a Catholic, but what, for what? Uh, she's not going to become a nun. She's, you know, a single mother and everything. Uh, and what was she going to do with all this, this, her radical convictions, her commitment to the poor and everything? And she she needed to this kind of find the spark, you know, from Peter Moran that she met, it kind of uh, this kindling that was waiting there to come, you know, to come alive. You know, and, you know, in the case of Sister Wendy, I think that there were matters of not just a vocation, but temperament, you know, deeply. I mean, I think that I, I don't I think it's fair to say that she you would say that she was sort of on the autism spectrum uh, and from her earliest childhood, her descriptions of of just not really relating to other people. She describes how once her mother invited a little child to come play at the house and she said, OK, you'll sit there and read your book and I'll sit here and read my book. And her mother said, that's not how you play. What do you, what do you, well, how do you play? She, she had no idea uh, about that. She spent the whole time when, when she went to Oxford, 
uh, the, uh, the superior of the community where she was living said, now you're not to talk to anybody. You're just supposed to go there and you come back. And the other uh, sisters thought that was insane. But she, so she went the whole time when she was in school without talking to a single other person. Uh, and that's the way she sort of liked it. Uh, there was this way in which she just felt that other people didn't understand her and she didn't quite really understand them. Um, and uh, and somehow though she had found herself through this backward backdoor way to the place that was just right for her. Uh, and so that was a, an interesting, you know, topic for that we shared, reflecting lots of saints about the about how in vocation, you know, finding the kind of match between what they felt called to do, but also who they were with a fit with. Uh, and when that happened, something you know clicks, and and there's this incredible vitality and energy and aliveness uh, that wasn't there before. Thank you so much. I'm curious at the beginning of your introduction, you said every time you read it, you learn something new, including the last two days. So I'd love to hear what new thing, what new revelation on reading the book again came to you. Well, it, it, again, it's a funny thing. I didn't exactly write this book. You know, I received these letters and uh, often, you know, they, I would receive them and I would, I would read them. Something would it would associate something for me or I'd have some kind of response and I'd respond to her uh, without perhaps even, you know, thinking about her letter very much. You know, it was so, such a quick kind of, if, it, if this, if these had been written letters, we would have been had to wait for a week or so for a response. Or by that time, you know, the mood would have changed or whatever. There was this immediacy to it. And then after she, uh, it was only after she died that I, I just went to the computer and, began to read it all all through again and of course there was a lot there that was not necessarily worth reading or interesting but it would you know it took uh, weeks to get through the whole thing 350,000 words uh, and I began to see yeah there's there's really a lot in here you know and so I edited and edited and I went through many many different drafts and taking out things and stuff uh, but still there's a tendency to to read too quickly and sometimes you know I I you know, it was when I, the kind of last draft, when uh, Dan mentioned, I began inserting some of these responses. It was almost, they were not necessarily responses I had at the time. It was, it was more my reaction now to reading this uh, again. Uh, but the, um, I, I can't point to a, a thing I just discovered, you know, today in reading it or something. It's more a thing like, oh, wow, I hadn't really clicked with that. I hadn't really thought about that, you know, so, so deeply. Uh, about what she had to say about the cross or suffering or um, there was a, there's a little, you know amusing kind of I mean it's a little thing at the end she was in her last months of her life she suddenly had this idea that maybe she would write commentaries on these icons by Bill Father Bill McNichols maybe you know people are familiar with his work uh, he's a mutual friend of ours and and she loved his work uh, and at first then, but then she said I, yeah I'd like to do some reflections but then she said I, I don't know how to do that I I, I get to just you know, swept away contemplating the mystery of the icon and I can't write about it. And I said, well, that's fine if, you know, but, but if maybe you don't have to comment on the icon, you just, you know, was, let's say an icon about John of the Bap, John the Baptist, just, you know, well, what, what that suggests to you about his story and everything. And uh, so she says, well, okay, I'll give that a try. And then, you know, she writes this amazing meditation on John the Baptist uh, where, you know, things that I had never thought of before where, you know, when he says, you know, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, and, you know, we think of the Lamb as meekness and all this kind of stuff. But no, he, John the Baptist was seeing immediately that Jesus was going to die. You know, he was seeing his passion right there from the beginning. Uh, and the fact that John the Baptist did not become a follower of Jesus, he was just the one who you know, pointed to him and his sense of his inadequacy or how small he was compared to Jesus and seeing something that Jesus didn't see in himself, you know. Uh, at that time. Uh, anyway, these these just kind of lightning flashes of insight that, that came to her, and the fact that she could bring lightning flashes to my describing a dream I had, or, you know, whatever, or a book I was working on, or something like that, or an argument that I had with somebody, uh, what I saw outside my window, was uh, 
was, you know, just still astonishing to me. I, I just, I just, I know I've reread this thing half a dozen times and even since it was published. And uh, every time I just kind of takes my breath away. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this so much. I um, remember Sister Wendy on TV, but I don't think that I knew anything about her. I don't think I know anything about her outside of what I've learned from you this evening. So I'm wondering, so I don't know the story and I'm so, I'd be so interested to hear it from you of how a person who sort of plays independently together and sometimes is so focused on God that the rest of the world gets blotted out. I love that image, although it is unfamiliar to me. <laughs> um, how she, like, what is it about the visual arts that pierced that blotting that sort of served as an icon for her, a sort of, how, how did she connect with art and how did the BBC connect with her? I think that was rather late in her life. You know, I don't think it was something that was an interest of, of hers uh, earlier. She was living in this caravan or trailer on the grounds of the monastery and contributing to the monastery. It'll you know, pay her and help to provide for her keep by doing translations from uh, Latin of medieval texts and things. And she began to get very worn out by doing this. And she asked the, uh, the prioress, would you be all right if I, if I spent some time just looking at books of about painting and they said okay and uh, so she really was kind of uh, self educated about art and she she never thought of herself as a scholar uh, about art uh but it was uh, i found that sister wendy anything that she gazed on she seemed to have this uh, just amazing insight into the kind of inner depths a little amusing sideline just an example uh, she revealed to me that uh, when she traveled, you know, going to hotels and things, she liked to watch sports on on TV. And she said, I, I liked I liked to watch horse racing in particular, They're not just the beauty of the horses. But I, I found that I had an incredible gift for being able to, to know which horse was going to win. And I probably could have made a lot of money on this. Uh, she said it was not so much that I knew which, you know, like I could predict which horse was going to win, is I could tell which horse wanted to win. Uh, and usually that was the one that that the one that wanted it the most would 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 do it. Uh, so th that was you know, just one example of this of her of somebody who was in so many ways, you know you you see people, you know, let's say uh, on the spectrum like uh, Greta Thunberg or something like that, who is very odd in a lot of other ways, uh, and yet has it's also a gift, you know. <laughs> I don't know, not in the sense of being a savant or something like that, but of looking at, at the world in a different way. And, you know, there's various degrees of this or whatever, but there was something in, in Sister Wendy that could just, uh, certain things that she didn't understand very well, I don't think, and other things that she could just enter into so deeply. And art became this, both a language for talking to other people about, about you know, about beauty, you know, the love of beauty, is you know, or is just like the love of truth or the love of goodness is is a way toward the kind of uh transcendental deep you know realities and she felt that it was a way of talking about god uh and uh and it it was a kind of language for her i mean she didn't she didn't listen to music she said the music is too emotional it just I, it, sw it sweeps you away she never had been to a movie in her life <laughs> she went to a concert one time uh, and so when someone took her to the opera and she said it was like almost too much, it was too, oh, too overwhelming. Uh, here's somebody who said that she couldn't share a cell with a cat because that would be, you know, that uh, too emotionally demanding on, on too much distraction from focus on, on God alone. But, you know, she, when she, she moved, so in, they actually built a little, little, little building for outhouse for her outside of her trailer, just for all her art books, which got to be so, you know, they're so voluminous, her whole library. And then she couldn't bring them all with her, but she moved into her cell there. And she, you know, she no longer, she didn't have even a window where she could see a little bit of sky, but she couldn't see anything else. She'd see a brick wall, you know. Uh, and she was happy with that because she said she, when she prayed all, she would pray at night. Like she would, 
at first she was getting up at, at 11 o'clock or something. Then she said later, she said, I'm, I get up at eight o'clock at night, you know, to pray and pray the rest of the night. Like, like, like long before I go to bed, she's up, she's her, her, her prayer day has already begun and she would pray all night. She'd pray with her eyes closed. And what, what was this prayer? Well, just being present to God. And uh, it was, you know, I, I can't really relate to that, but whatever it was that happened in that, experience of silence and prayer of focus concentration uh it just sharpened somehow you know this inner eye that she had uh, so you know she's just you you read her commentaries on on art and maybe an art historian or would scoff at something she said or whatever uh, but you read it and she's oh and you think oh, gosh i never would have seen that in a million years now that she brings out this drama that's going on in you know in a in a picture of a bowl of fruit or something like that, that she can see so much of what this is saying. You know, Cezanne was actually her favorite uh, artist. So not just religious art, you know, but anything uh, that that showed, where, you know, that an artist had put their soul into something, uh, she could she could uh, speak to that. But she said at one point, uh, you know, I, I don't have, you know, trees and everything, but I, I have pictures books, you know, and art books that remind me of what a tree looks like. I thought, oh, it sounded so sad. She didn't feel that was sad. She felt that her 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 soul was filled with just, you know, all of these images that she'd spent so much time uh, contemplating and seeing. Well, I think that may be uh, a good place for us to wrap up. There's so much more. And uh, the good news is, especially for those here with us, you can buy the book and read the more for yourself. Um, but I know that Robert will be here as well to chat with folks in the atrium afterwards. Um, uh, just a few notes of thanks. Um, first to Dr. Julia Fetter, who is uh, working at the Center for Spirituality this year with us as a project coordinator and who has been uh, our microphone on, on in motion around the room. Uh, thanks to Miss Rebecca Holm and Miss Maria Dock, who are uh, our, our student workers. Uh, Rebecca's up here uh, making sure our tech is working uh, swimmingly, and, um, and Maria will be uh, editing this for posting later on. Um, and a special thanks to Robert Ellsberg for taking the time to be here, for joining us on campus, for allowing us to enter into this relationship with you and Sister Wendy. Um, there is no overstatement, I should say, in anything that has been said in this, this evening presentation. Um, it really is compelling. It is a page turner that also at the same time paradoxically invites lots of reflection and deep um, consideration. So thank you for uh, the work to make this possible and sharing this friendship, this relationship with us. So please uh, join me in thanking Robert for his time here and for this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.